this event is a result of a new cooperation between the EMA, this is the European Mediterranean Arab Association with its headquarters in Berlin, and the NEX, the Network of Architecture Export in the GEM Federal Chamber of Architects, also located in Berlin. Just a brief note, please turn off your microphones, please, and uh, your cameras. Our format is nearly something complete new, a crossover between different areas. We meet representatives from the free economy, public and institutional units, as well as building planners, which I personally consider to be an important voice for the future-oriented shaping of our, of our environment and not only the built one. My name is Ute Pfeiffer and I'm your host today on behalf of the EMA and the NEX. As construction specialist, I've been working for decades as leader and manager in uh, the field of construction planning and corporate governance. For many years in my own office with about 80 employees, and now after a merger in a company with about 300 employees. For more than 10 years, we run an office in Abu Dhabi at um, the United Arab Emirates. And this is where my connection is from to the Arab world. And this is why my membership comes to EMA, especially my membership in the board. I also work as professional certified coach in order to pass on my experience of a long professional career. Now, a very warm welcome to the audience. A hearty greetings from my side to my colleagues from the EMA. First and foremost to our secretary channel, Mrs. Clara Grutroy, and to Mrs. Jens Kutscher. Head of Scientific Services and Communication, both deeply involved in organization of this event. And I would like to thank our panelists, who I will introduce to, to you in detail later, for their commitment and willingness to share their wide-ranging experience with all of us here. I mentioned at the beginning that this is a joint event of the EMA and the next. So I would like to give the floor or better the screen to Mrs. Claudia Sanders from the next. Claudia, please. Yes, Mrs. Pfeiffer, thank you very much. Um, also a very warm welcome and salam alaikum from, the, from Berlin as well, from the Network for Architecture Exchange. As Mrs. Pfeiffer already said, uh, this is a new cooperation between EMA and NEX, and we are very happy and grateful for this opportunity today to get together and discuss uh, the sustainable planning and construction in Egypt and hear from two of our members uh, about their experiences and also share the experiences and, and expectations from the Egypt sides. So thanks very much also to our known architects and members, uh, Achim Krekeler from Krekeler Architekten Generalplaner and Mr. Jürgen Hepp from ASNP Architects in Frankfurt. Uh, thanks very much for joining us here. And I will give back the floor to uh, Ute Pfeiffer and our moderator today. And I'm very curious about all the discussions and uh, yeah, let's go and start discuss uh, about the construction sites and works going on uh, on the sustainability side in Egypt. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Claudia, uh, for your words and for your very warm welcome uh, to the audience. Currently, so um, we are facing worldwide tremendous challenges in matters of preservation of our ecosystems creation of adequate living and working space of our growing world population, basic supply and maintenance of supply chains and much more. That we are talking about Egypt today is no coincidence. The next UN climate change conference will be held in Egypt this, the coming November. Egypt is currently facing incredible challenges. 
One of them is the growing population, which has increased with a considerable speed from some 70 millions in the 2000s to more than 100 million in just 20 years. The continuing population growth is estimated at about 2.45%. The average 25 years old with the largest share of 14 and 64 years old. Many new residential projects and urban settlements are under construction all over the country. And we think to recognize excellent opportunities for developers, investors, suppliers, or other business partners to take part in the growth while striving for a healthier world. This online roundtable will give you an insight into construction projects and will also show you the best practice examples and possible opportunities for future German Egyptian corporations. Now let me introduce our guests and panelists to you one after the other. So we will start with Isabel Knauf, a very warm welcome to you. I'm so happy to meet you finally because you are a member of the EMA just like me. Building materials from Knauf are used all over the world. You are a member of the management board of the German Knauf Gips KG and you will give us an insight into your company's commitment in Egypt. Then Mr. Mr. Jürgen Hepp, architect and um, planner, urban planner, as we already learned, associate partner of the German planning office, Albert Speer and partner. He will report about an ambitious urban development project in Egypt. Ah, perhaps, would you please put up your hand when you can see me? Okay, and Mrs. Knauf, would you please put your hand once again? Thank you. Then we have an idea of the persons we meet here. Then uh, I'm happy uh, to introduce to you Dr. Achim Kregeler, founder and member of the advisory board of his company, represents Kregeler Architekten Generalplaner GmbH, one of Germany's leading planning firms for preservation and restoration of historic building. And I'm very curious to hear what he will bring us about his and his company's engagement in Egypt. Mr. Kregeler, would you please put your hand up. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. And also a very warm welcome to Egypt to Mr. Abdel Hamid, engineer and chairman of the Chamber of Building Materials Industry, Federation of Egyptian Industries. The Chamber serves as a voice and platform for building materials manufacturers in Egypt and also promotes contacts with a new Business, with new business partners, national and international. And I feel very honored to meet our EMA member, Mr. Youssef Ahmad, founding partner and managing director of the FIC, Frankfurt International Consulting Firm, which provides support for the establishment of companies in the Arab region. It is also important to mention that he is, among other engagements, board member of the AHK, Arab German Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Cairo. Yusuf Ahmed lives in Egypt and will bring us in the course of our question and answer session closer to Egypt from his professional and from his personal point of view. Before we start in the order in which I introduced the panelists, just a short note from my side about the organization. As a presenting panelist, please introduce yourself again briefly before you start. It is important that you keep to the time frame, as I already mentioned, around 15 to 20 minutes. And if you are about to exceed the time, I will give you a short sum. This are uh, okay. So now, ladies first, and uh, the screen is yours, Miss Isabel Knauf, please. 
Good morning. My name is Isabel Knauf. I'm a partner of the Knauf Group and a member of the Car Partners Committee. Until recently, I was in the active management and um, member of the Knauf Group Management Committee. So for the last 20 years, I've been actively re responsible for our business in Southern Europe, Middle East, South Asia and Africa. Now I've moved to the supervisory board. The Knauf Group is a 100% family owned uh, company. We do a turnover of about 12.7 billion euros annually and employ over 40,000 employees. The Knauf Group came to Egypt in 1998 and um, started its first uh, incorporation as uh, in 2003, we had a, a training center and a warehouse in Gizeh. And um, in 2011, we took the decision to uh, build a factory and produce locally. And uh, the first uh, factory went into production in Suez in 2014. Um, in 2015, we saw the enormous uh, development in the construction business in Egypt and decided to double the capacity uh, which so the new line Suez 2 went into production in 2019 and we have recently taken the decision to double our capacity again so um, which will be going into production inshallah at the end of uh, 2023 beginning of 2024. So um, up to now, we've uh, been, uh, we've, we are about one sixth of all foreign direct investment from Germany in Egypt, and we plan on doubling that figure now. Um, the new plant is uh, very interesting also in the sense that not only have we on the old lines reduced our energy consumption by over 15% in the past years, the new line is going to be another 15% more efficient. And uh, we've already planned it in a way that we can um, switch to either electrical heating or uh, hydrogen heating, depending on what the Egyptian government will make available through its infrastructure. We've already uh, pre-planned to be able to convert when that happens. There, the Egyptian government right now is uh, working on a number of uh, or licensing a number of uh, solar projects south of uh, Suez. So we're very much looking forward to what is happening there. In general, our product, we make uh, gypsum products, plasterboard, uh, ceiling tiles, gypsum plasters, metal profiles. We produce the full system in Egypt which is also from a sustainable point of view, uh, we're local. So we have much less transportation costs. We're local with um, um, an extremely high level of local content. The advantage of uh, gypsum is uh, that it consumes a lot less energy when you're producing it than traditional cons uh, construction materials. To be clear, um, cement, for example, is processed at 1400 uh, degrees Celsius, while gypsum is processed at 160 degrees Celsius. Also on cement, uh, you emit one molecule of uh, CO2 for every molecule of cement that you're producing of CO, CO3, when you're going from CO, CaCO3 to CaO. Um, gypsum, you're just evaporating the crystal water and putting the crystal water back in. So gypsum is basically indefinitely recyclable. Uh, we're now also enlarging uh, our making a big um, gypsum recycling plant. So we will be um, recycling 100% of our own scrap and have the possibility to in the future also recycle uh, external material. However, gypsum uh, boards have not been in the market that long that there's not much um, material available for recycling at this moment. But in, to put it into comparison, for example, in Denmark, we are um, working with uh, about 35% post-consumer recycling gypsum in our factories. 
So um, it's um, both from the energy point of view, as well as from the material recycling point of view, it's a very, very healthy project product. Um, Regarding construction in, in Egypt, construction, as you all know, has uh, gone, undergone an enormous development. Um, one is, of course, because of the population. Um, we, when I arrived in Egypt first time, we were at 70 million people. We're now at well over 100 million people. And uh, also habits uh, were very conventional with um, brick and mortar and everything in cement. This was, of course, also because of a misguided uh, subsidy policy. To be clear, uh, until the early 2000s, there, was, uh, there were subsidies, energy subsidies for the cement and brick industry. And only when these um, subsidies were removed, and nowadays industrial gas is uh, provided to all users at the same rate, um, this, uh, this was more balanced. Nevertheless, modern construction methods are slow in coming to Egypt, and these new projects um, are making them move forward. To be, to be clear, if you're building a project um, like the iconic tower in, uh, in New Cairo, you cannot continue to build in the old way. Um, the new the, the weight of the traditional materials would limit the height of the building. So um, if you look at the, a square meter of wall coming from traditional materials and a square meter of wall uh, being built in drywall construction, you're looking at um, five times the weight. And that would affect the foundations, the, the central structure, everything. So the new, the new projects are um, forcing a rethinking of how to how to build, not just from a sustainable point of view, but also from building high buildings, from a weight point of view, from an earthquake protection point of view, because it's a drywall construction, because it's light, has um, is um, creating um, uh, less earthquake risk. And um, you also have fire protection. It's much easier to do fire protection with the modern construction methods than uh, with the traditional construction materials. We've been seeing that the consumption of modern methods has grown. However, Egypt is still on, uh, on a certain trajectory here. If you compare the consumption of uh, drywall in Egypt to the neighboring countries, um, we have a, an index which is square meters of plasterboard consumed uh, per capita. Um, Egypt is only at 0.3 square meters per capita. In comparison, Algeria is at twice that rate, 0.6. Um, Libya is at one. Uh, Saudi Arabia is at 1.3, Turkey is at 1.5. So we are we still have uh, quite a way to go in um, uh, in convincing and educating people to use the modern construction methods. Knauf is uh, contributing to uh, to this way because. Um, we founded our first training center in Gizeh in 2003. Um, in 2019, we started um, another construction, the construction of another training center in Alexandria and one in Asyut. So we now have three training centers. We've closed the old one in, in Gizeh in Cairo. And two weeks ago, we reopened uh, the new training center in Cairo. And uh, so we now operate three training centers. This training, these training centers provide training um, for craftsmen. So we have uh, practical training for all kinds of, of modern construction methods, but also it provides seminars for architects and civil engineers on specific subjects like fire protection, sound protection, earthquake protection and um, also offers courses for students.
from the Egyptian universities. So uh, we are hoping to accompany this because it, while landmark projects like the iconic tower are now um, curated by uh, foreign um, architect firms, um, Egypt needs to be able to build itself for the future. And um, this is um, why we need to um, not hand out fish, but teach people how to fish. And that, and that is um, what we're trying to do by both educating the university students, the civil engineers, architects afterwards, as well as the craftsmen, so that somebody actually knows how to applicate uh, new construction materials. This is um, the other thing that is coming at Egypt is of course, how does Egypt build not only higher but also, and more, but also um, more energy efficient um, products um, and buildings. Um, Kanaf is also the second largest in, um, insulation producer on earth. And we sincerely hope that um, the new ways of building will also include insulating the, bu the buildings better. Everybody is talking about energy transition, but um, the energy transition basically consists of two parts. First, you have to reduce the energy consumption and then you can replace it. And uh, if you look at it, uh, the United States, now even today, the insulation consumption in Florida is much higher than the insulation uh, consumption in the, Middle West, in the Middle West, where it gets minus 20 degrees in the, the winter. That's because it takes more energy to air condition than to heat. So if, if um, uh, Egyptians, as their um, wealth increases, they're going to want more air conditioning. And that means we're going to also have to build buildings that are more energy sustainable. And that means if we want to air conditioning, air condition, we need to make that very efficient, both technically and by insulating. So we have uh, less loss. So these are the challenges as we see it. Uh, there are challenges, but there are also very big opportunities. And uh, we as Knauf are um, happy to be able to join the Egyptian population in uh, on their way. And we are investing um, another 80 million euros uh, in order to back that up. Thank you, Mrs. Thank Knauf. You. This all sounds very, very interesting. And many thanks for the introduction of your company, of your product, your products. Um, it was very impressive to hear about your success in Egypt, uh, but it was also very impressive uh, to hear about your innovations, uh, about your innovation products, uh, these light structures. And personally, me, I'm a representative of a, a structural engineering office. This is very, very interesting for me, yes, uh, because uh, we actually uh, need new products, uh, new building mater materials. And this is, uh, let me say, um, uh, very promising what you are introduced to us. Thank you so much. So please, uh, we would go on. Ah, just a comment from my side. Uh, for the audience, uh, feel free, if you had any questions or any comments, uh, write it down in the chat. Uh, from time to time, we'll, I have a look onto the chat and maybe afterwards in our uh, question and answer session, we will come back to your questions. So uh, now, Jürgen Hepp, it's your turn and uh, you will give us an insight into your work in Egypt. So you can start, please. Can you see my screen already? Oh. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, I hope the right one. So it's the presenter mode, yeah? Uh, the presentation. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jürgen Hepp. I'm an architect and urban designer and associate partner at ASMP. I've been involved in the Middle East and the region, um, uh, North Africa, but also in Africa since 2007. So um, I was fortunate to start on the uh, Master City project in Abu Dhabi, was actually involved with that zero carbon, zero waste city for about five years. And actually 
being located three years in Abu Dhabi. So I'm I'm actually quite familiar making large projects and try to make them um, come true. Besides that, I've been working also in uh, projects uh, in South Africa uh, on the Seychelles, but also in Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia. Besides that, I'm also working sometimes in Germany as well. Gives a nice balance of works uh, between architecture and urban planning. Now, today I would like to introduce to you Badia City in Cairo, which is uh, which we've done primarily in 2007 and 2018, but it uh, now starts to come into flourishing. And I think it's actually a relevant project because it does um, um, try to give answers to some of the questions which are very pressing to us right now in terms of the urban growth. Um, we are now in a population of um, more than 57% living in urban areas, and that has actually dramatically increased in the last 10, 20 years. And it's expected to go further urban uh, till 2050 with about 70% living in urban areas. And Cairo actually, especially is, uh, as you said before already, is, is an area where we see that uh, urbanization on um, a really on, on dramatic scales. Uh, last time I gave a talk about Badia, uh, that population was still at 20, 0.5 million inhabitants, and last night I needed to revise that figure to 21.8 million people. So it says actually it's quite dynamic uh, how Cairo is growing. But to put it in perspective, actually, Cairo's population of uh, greater metropolitan Cairo is adding North Rhine-Westphalia and Brandenburg, North Rhine-Westphalia, the most populated state in, in Germany, and Brandenburg, and, and potentially now plus Munich, um, to get that number. So we are really talking about complete different scales and it's further growing. So Cairo is expected to be 25 and a half million people by 2030. But now the question is, where's the growth going? And of course, Cairo is there because of the uh, River Nile Delta, a very fertile land. But you see here an image of 2000. And here we see an image of the same area of 2018. So there's a dramatic growth going into that fertile land. And of course, when we talk about sustainable urban development, cities always have eaten up the most fertile land. But of course, in, in Egypt, that's very dramatic if we get all that land uh, for construction. And now when you look at some of these constructions, they are very informal, but informal on a different scale, not like when we see informal settlements, let's say in South America, here we have like really high rises, which are absolutely not permitted. They have no uh, building permit, no planning permission, nor uh, do some of these buildings have proper servicing. Another consequence of that is, of course, the traffic issue. Cairo is amongst the worst cities traffic wise uh, globally. Um, wherever we, we assume about 20 minutes uh, or half an hour to get from A to B, Whenever I was in Cairo, I always um, calculated with a two hour ride. Um, so it's, it's, of course, traffic is very dramatic. And hence, of course, it's very understandable that Cairo tries to grow away from that fertile uh, areas and try to create these new cities in the West, 6th of October, in which Badia is part, we see here. And in the East, we have new Cairo. Um, but when we then look into some of these developments, they are actually fairly, let's say, monotonous. And I, I, I've, I'm wondering uh, what, what the sense of place actually is. Um, of course, there is uh, the need for rapid growth and rapid production. That's why uh, we only see two types which have been twisted and turned and arranged in different patterns to create some some kind of variety and in between there's a bit of green. While there are more extreme examples where you actually wonder, is that actually still living or is it living on a car park or in amongst the car parks? So of course, that is another um, dramatic image of where some of these growth goes. So it's a very car dominated, but also not really a, a pleasant sense of place. So for us, it was really the question on how can we now ensure to create a people's place um, and a living uh, 2040 model, uh, which is centered around the humans and not around the cars. 
Um, and therefore, we created uh, this master plan for Badia, which is, of course, going back to old uh, centuries of uh, city developments, but of course a bit faster, uh, where we said we need to have a proper city center which can cater for the needs for all the people living here, but also having districts and district centers like you see here. And they all arrange this uh, Grand Boulevard and basically interconnected through an intrinsic network of uh, pathways. All in all, uh, Badia should house at the end about 150,000 inhabitants uh, with about 48,000 workplaces on about 1,250 hectare. So that gives us a cross density of 120 people per hectare. And that's actually where sustainability in urban planning already um, is a, um, starts. We need to start with the right density to uh, really get a sustainable urban development. And that is basically then underpinned with about 20% of uh, parks and uh, public spaces. But to bring it more tangible, so we said actually the city needs to be convenient and easy. So this is one of the district centers where we said actually the district centers should cater for the 10 minute uh, weekly needs. So it needs to be reachable within 10 minutes walk while the daily needs will be catered within each of the neighborhoods and the monthly needs on the 15 minutes um, cycling distance would then be catered in the city center. But it also, of course, needs to be a livable and safe place. It needs to be a safe place for all participants uh, of public life, that being the old and the young, the able and the disabled. So we try to really create a city that uh, can cater for all uh, circumstances in life. But we also think a city needs to be based on creativity and vibrancy. So we cannot just create this uh, monotonous um, residential to create places that can be enjoyed and that uh, can be um, uh, cherished by all people and um, need, need to be a destination. But of course, that also needs to be encapsulated in an overarching green uh, structure that is sustainable. And for us, the, the green network is more than just being green and giving a nice, pleasant environment. That the network needs to have here, for instance, in this image, we see part of our sustainable urban drainage strategy. We know that in the whole region that uh, um, drainage swales and so on usually clog up because drain is too infrequent and therefore we, we have this blockage within the systems. Therefore, we try to create a low key system which can attenuate um, the water much more locally and uh, be part of the active uh, landscape design. But it also needs to be smart and integrated and smart urban planning for us is, of course, it starts with the spatial arrangements, but also the integration of all the different systems we see, like cycling and walking, which in, in general is for us the micro mobility that then um, supports, is supported by and, and other means of transport, and that needs to be integrated in a smart manner. So here we see, for instance, that the green network and uh, this micro mobility network for walking and cycling is an intrinsic part of the design and it uh, basically weaves itself through each of the neighborhoods. And uh, that basically is for us the, the smartness of urban planning uh, at the core when we make the first sketches. So creating this uh, integrated green network that supports cycling and walking, that then uh, supports the public transport. And as the third consideration in the mobility, then we look at the, at the car. It's not the first, it's the third consideration. And here you see a little animation on how these 225 kilometers of cycling and pedestrian paths have been integrated. And you see a rather organic pattern and uh, we can actually reach um, these paths within 75 meter on any place. And the green network that supports all, all, all these micro mobility uh, paths. And here uh, we see the central park, which also forms the backbone of our um, um, uh, smart mobility network, but also green network. And it has this clubs area, the sports club area, 
for those who work uh, a lot in Egypt know that sports clubs are always a very important part of the community and therefore it's also here placed in the center. And of course the green city means also we try to create a healthy and active city. We, with that we can start enhancing the microclimate and hopefully um, reduce the heat island effect through also creating improved air quality. But that then allows us really for walking and cycling within the city, but also generally promoting outdoor activities. And those can be very different. Here we see, for instance, the Central Park, nighttime activities, concerts, and other events, but also for sports within each of the residential neighborhoods but also recreational within, for instance, the apartment blocks. For all, uh, this is really for us a, a, an overall uh, sustainable ecosystem, and it's basically here illustrated with all the manifold um, elements that are required to really create a truly sustainable city. Looking at the water consumption, so one target is, for instance, not having more water consumed by irrigation than we can actually produce by black and gray water. Um, but also some low renewable energies. Target is modestly at 30%. I believe actually soon we will see that in Egypt there will be much more renewable energies because solar power is just so cheap nowadays that it will inevitably be um, the primary source of energy in the future. But then also looking, for instance, in waste management and have already the ability to sort the waste. Once um, we have a more global system or a, a, a citywide system of uh, recycling, then um, Badia can be catered for there as well. And that basically creates that really livable and fantastic environment. Now, one thing, and I've shown these images before, this need for rapid construction uh, because the population growth is so dramatic it's of course we cannot like sometimes in germany we take quite a rather long time to make uh, a few building units um, here we need to think on a different scale and different time scale especially but still we wanted to create something that allows for individuality and individual architecture and therefore we said of course the answer cannot be those examples from the 60s and 70s, which uh, were uh, maybe rapidly producible, but created a horrible sense of place. While we actually knew it already better in the Gründerzeit or Victorian times, where it was all also very highly modular and people used the rule book uh, in those settlements, but they have much more character because they are different in their vernacular and in their style. And therefore, we try to create a methodology to have a, a large variety of typologies, which can be applied and work on a basic system. And for us, of course, it was primarily in the apartments where we said we need to create the block and we have a simple urban block with some pantyform buildings. And we subdivided the block in different unit sizes, being it end type, corner types and middle types. And within the apartments, then we looked into uh, a room modules, which can be exchangeable and which can be differently structured. And that idea actually came out when there was the big question, do the Egyptians like open plan kitchens or closed plan kitchens? And I said, who am I to answer that question? I don't know. And therefore we said, actually, we should create that room module system in which we can have different fit out solutions depending on uh, what the customers actually want to have. So as long as our, our primary structure keeps the same, we can apply different inner, inner modules which can be actually uh, configured in different ways. And we then created this interactive toolbox which allowed that choice actually it's designed for the end customer to ultimately decide, for instance, do they want to have the open plan kitchen together with the living room or should it be closed and have an additional room here? And with that, we could create actually for phase one already 6,000 uh, units uh, based on 50 building types and based on 215 apartment types. 
And even though uh, even we can allow and have allowed for different facade types. Of course, here you see, as I think, a quite seductive, nice uh, facade system. Um, um, that in matters of the time management, you can around, have around five minutes. Yeah, um, but I'm I give you a small good. sign. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm nearly there. We see here, for instance, the um, the inner inner apartment block. Um, um, of one of these types. And here we see the different facade types which we've then applied to the same underlying uh, building module or building type. And the first test came really about this when we looked at the apartment configuration in the urban blocks uh, to uh, construct a one to 1000 uh, city model. And this model was constructed here in Germany in Darmstadt and it took about five weeks, um, but we, we basically gave them the same types as we have designed them, and they could be CNC'd out and then placed in the model. So that was for us the first proof that we can actually create quite quickly a big, big city pieces on a, on a rational system while, uh, while we're still trying to avoid this monotonous look of uh, some of the examples we've seen before. And the, this model then was the centerpiece of, of the launch event in 2018, where we used um, top-down projections to really explain uh, the scheme. Um, we even made the whole multimedia interface together with a partner here out of Germany and created the whole story. Here we see, for instance, the cycling and micromobility network. Uh, but also like different building types, the apartments or here the, the different centers. Uh, so it was a very engaging way of showing how how Badia is composed and will be growing in the future. Um, the whole loop took about 15 minutes. Uh, and at the event, we saw quite a few people actually going um, uh, in again and again because um, they quite they quite uh, liked that engaging of the model and it's still running so you can visit the showroom of Padia and and see the model live uh, in Cairo in this uh, farm hills headquarters. So, but this is uh, this was 2018 and here we see the first implementation of images from last year. So we see already the cycle path and some of the green network. And here we are in one of the villa districts and here again, cycling and walking path. And uh, this is one of our living street examples where we believe this is a people's place. And on that note, I'm uh, done with my quick presentation. As we wish, well, I had too many slides. Okay. Uh Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hepp. Um, you, uh, you stopped just in time, I have to tell you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting and very impressive uh, what you showed us. And uh, for me, um, it was most interesting to hear more than only architecture and construction. Uh, we heard about social, ecological, cultural, and economic development. Yes, this is all about towns this is all about cities thank you thank you very much and okay. uh, now uh, we uh, turn to our next panelist uh, this is dr achim krekala uh, i hope you are ready for your presentation aren't you the technique yes um, i'm fine okay well then... if you please but but it has to be open from from your side yes okay when uh, to the technique, it's, I think it's in Skutja, we can start. And we are curious uh, about what you have to tell us today. Okay. My name is Achim Krikler. I'm an architect and I made my PhD in monument preservation and building research. Uh, I just changed from uh, managing director to a supervising board, to the supervising board in, in our office. So I'm just uh, I, and uh, my, my son took, and my uh, other colleagues took over our office. So 
With my presentation, I'm looking a little bit back to the to the past, and we will have a look uh, to the to the old and the existing buildings of of Cairo and uh, Egypt. <clears throat> Egypt is playing a key role in my personal and our office history. My personal prof professional career was shaped by almost 10 years of professional stay in Egypt. First as an, a research assistant at the Swiss Institute of Historical Egyptian Building Research, and then as a consultant for monument preservation and architecture, just uh, keep the first uh, page. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, um, as a consultant for monument preserv preservation and architecture at the German Archaeological Institute in Cairo. I can say that I learned to walk professionally in Egypt. The work in the Pyramid Cemetery of uh, Saqqara in the historic old city of Cairo and in the ruins uh, uh, from other sites like Elephantine and Aswan shaped me for my future professional uh, de development. In addition, to Egypt's ancient monuments, I also found the modern buildings in Egypt interesting. Cairo and Alexandria have a valuable stock of old buildings from the end of the 19th century up to the uh, to the to the uh, last uh, so to the middle of the 20th century. <clears throat> the buildings of Hassan Fateh and Wissa Wassef, who uh, started the traditional way of building again was started in the 15th, 16th uh, of the last century. And the settlements and the new settlements in Elguna are particularly interesting in, in the focus of our current discussion on the topic of sustainability. By using traditional building materials and construction forms, buildings, are, uh, buildings were created that retire uh, little energy and are well suited to the Egyptian climate. In addition to the intensive study of Egyptian architecture and history, I was able to immense, immerse myself deep, deeply into a social life in Cairo and also in Aswan. After the German reunification, very interesting tasks, tasks opened, in, opened up in, in Germany in the field of monument preservation and renovation of old buildings. This led me to set up an office for preservation of historical monuments and refurbishment in the new federal states of Germany. Next, say, next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> we, uh, currently we have two branch offices and about uh, 90 employee, employees working in this field. Uh, during this time, however, I kept a foothold in Egypt. We could also realize a number of projects there. Please, next slide. In Germany, the office developed to a Germany-wide office uh, for architecture and general planning, which was able to gain extensive experiences in the renovation and conservation of historical buildings, such as castles, sacral, and industrial buildings, this also includes five UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Next, please. Building abroad expanded to several countries, including projects in Asia and South America. In the meantime, we have been planning and building abroad for nearly 30 years. Our clients are mostly German authorities, such as the foreign ministry. The majority of our projects are existing buildings, often high profile monuments. Next, please. In order to bring the building into future, we analyze the buildings very carefully at the beginning and develop their qualities sensitive, very sensitively. In Egypt, we had the opportunity to work on some projects like Goethe Institute Alexandria. Next, please. The Nizel Public Library and the modernization of the German embassy in, in Cairo. There, we were very happy that, that we could use Egyptian, Egyptian uh, boards from, from Knauf produced in Egypt. Every era has left behind a building stock with, a special, with special features. We should learn from the positive examples of the past 
and preserve the substance to the future. If buildings have survived for such a long time, sometimes for several hundred years, this is usually due to their utilities, utility of value and their robustness. Often they also create, create identity and are characteristic for the neighborhood. Many of the buildings in Cairo, Cairo's historical old city center are medieval Islamic structures. They were mainly built of natural stone, brick, lime, and clay. These materials and buildings forms are well adapted to climate and uh, climate conditions could be well buffered. Repairs are usually easy. During the building boom in the late 19th century and early 20th century, cement, concrete, and steel were added, were added to the building materials. However, most of the building fabric was still made of natural stone, bricks, lime, and wood. The thick walls and construction made the building robust and buffered the, temp the temperature peaks also to some extent. From the end of the 20th century until now, buildings are mainly made of concrete and concrete blocks. These building materials can only be produced in an energy intensive way, are difficult to recycle and buffer the summer heat only slightly. Air conditioning is needed to make living comfortable. The buildings must therefore be packed with fast moving air conditioning and uh, technique. Since the concrete structures are usually slender, there is often little reserve to change of the alterations. If these buildings became damages or do not longer meet the requirements for use, they are usually demolished. Many buildings of this period, therefore, have uh, only a short living uh, time. Next. In Egypt, the large stock of old buildings from different areas offer a huge potential for preserving and developing quality housing in existing neighborhoods. The ratio uh, of resource using uh, reno between renovation and old buildings and new construction is one to four. Therefore, the old building stock in Egypt offers great opportunities. Uh, here on the, on the slide, you see a, uh, a four-story house in Mansura, which was uh, at least uh, demolished and replaced by a 10-story house. This is very, a very common development in, in Egypt. In Egypt, I therefore see a great potential for conservation uh, to conserve resources and to preserve and reactivate quality housing through more building in the existing stock. The goal should be to use the existing building stock as long as possible. Within the framework of a new cooperation between Helwan University and the Technical University of Berlin, our office was a practical partner. Next, please. Joint workshops uh, were held with students from both countries. And uh, on the picture left, left you see young uh, experts together with our expert. Uh, and on the right side, you see the building which was studied and uh, plans were made for this building. Perhaps the, perhaps the careful handling similar to, uh, to the way uh, the Egyptian Antiquity Service is, is dealing with, with the monuments, next please, uh, could be a good example for us. The pictures are showing uh, one of our ongoing archaeological projects. This is, uh, this is an, an, a temple, in, a small Roman temple in, in Aswan. And our restorer is working together with colleagues from the Egyptian side, uh, reassembling um, historic blocks and uh, producing, also reproducing uh, historical uh, mortar mixtures. We are mixing the, the lime, for example, uh, on, the, on the side, mixing it uh, with sand and, uh, and uh, uh, training uh, historic technologies on the spot. Yeah. <clears throat> um, next, please. 
Uh, these examples from our old, own portfolio are, of course, not uh, useful for, for it's, it's not a solution for Cairo, but for maybe for, uh, for uh, rural regions. This uh, building we, we, we built uh, about 20 years ago, uh, this expedition house in, in the oasis of Dachla. And uh, the building is completely made by, uh, on, from mud bricks and uh, natural stone uh, from the area. Next, please. And we had also the opportunity the Ahmed Fakri Desert Museum in Dachla, unfortunately not, uh, not realized. Okay, next. So, thank you for, for, for the attention. If my colleague Saima Khamis, she was engaged in in our Cairo research project, if she, if you could, if she wants to say some words in addition, I would be very happy. Yes, uh, we are awaiting her comments. So, um, may I ask her name once again, please? Salma Kamis. Yes, I see her. I will ask her to unmute her microphone and. If she and her, she can also turn her video on. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, good morning. I'm happy to meet I'm, you here, and uh, we are very grateful um, and curious about your comments in this project. Uh, Mr. Kregela introduced to us. Uh, yeah, I'm an Egyptian architect. Uh, I just finished my PhD here at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, I studied actually architecture and planning in Egypt at the Helwan and Cairo University and uh, had the chance to be a, an in, uh, to have an internship at uh, Dr. Krekela's office in Brandenburg uh, more than 20 years ago. So um, now I'm working, I'm part of the office again, uh, working also on uh, heritage conservation. Um, yeah, so uh, I think um this seminar for me uh, is not only focusing on the expert of the german uh, expertise but it's uh, actually the exchange of knowledge between uh, german experts and egyptian uh, experts so, so this is uh, actually what also krekela did he um while he was uh a young architect in egypt working at the german archaeological institute there he transferred his gained knowledge uh, through the Egyptian architecture and traditional buildings uh, of um, conserving these buildings to Germany and built up his office here. And uh, now he's uh, turning back uh, as a thank you for um, the Egyptian uh, community, but while uh, also contributing to, to my research project, uh, Real City Lab, between Helwan University in Egypt and um, Technical University of Berlin. So this was a great chance that he cooperated as a practitioner and, uh, and a conservator of uh, heritage buildings, because this part of, uh, of architecture, which Egypt is actually a world known country, uh, having a multi-layered uh, heritage, uh, thousand years old, um, is actually missing in the Egyptian education of architecture and planning and uh, focusing only on building new cities. Uh, as we also just uh, saw uh, by um, Mr. Jürgen Hepp, uh, it's not only building a new building, it's building a new city. So Egypt offers um, big parts of land uh, to build such new cities, but on the other hand, we should not neglect the old city. We should also preserve it and learn from it and from the construction materials used and from the planning, uh, the traditional planning, because Egypt is a hot, humid climate country. Uh, and it, this uh, climate should be considered while building new. 
And also, as I quote Krekela, that uh, uh, demolishing an old building and building a new one, which is actually now very common in the Egyptian case, and especially in Cairo, uh, on big cities like Cairo and Alexandria, that uh, the ratio is one to four uh, emission. So we should consider this before demolishing and building a new one, especially if we don't we if we don't work on uh, enhancing the new building materials uh, like concrete and uh, glass, because uh, building concrete and glass in Egypt is not actually climate friendly. Uh, yeah, and uh, thank you for this great uh, uh, pool to exchange our opinions. Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Salma Kamis. Um, this was very interesting, what, it, uh, what you had to told to us. You talked about the exchange exchange of knowledge this is i think this is very important yes what we as germs bring in and what you have in your tradition building materials and all the things yes you talked about uh, your climate which is different to uh, the climate in europe and so on uh, you also uh, talked about refurbishment and redevelopment of buildings and not only to focus on the new cities which are erected at the moment. I think this was a very important contribution as it was a very interesting presentation from your side, uh, Dr. Kregeler. Um, and I have to uh, say, I look forward to learn more about this field later, I hope in the question and answer session. And uh, I hope we have enough time to uh, talk about this subject once again. Thank you so much uh, to you both. Yes. So uh, our event is going on and um, I once again warmly welcome uh, Mr. Abdel Hamid as representative of the Egyptian Building Material Chamber. I would like to talk with you, Mr. Hamid, about the environmental impact of construction and construction methods. We all already mentioned this, this uh, subject. The process of constructing from a simple family home to a big infrastructure mega project can have unfavorable impact to the environment in many ways. We unfortunately learned already in the future. It means, or it can mean, destruction of ecosystems, air pollution as a result of high energy use, for manufacturing process, for example, cement, for uh, destruction of local fauna and flora, high levels of CO2 emissions, where are transported long distances, water, gravel and sand are becoming increasingly scarce. Sustainability in general sense of protecting the iron wind and keeps the ecosystems balanced. This is the bottom line. And now um, my questions to Mr. Abdelhamid. What do you think will be the biggest challenge in the future to make buildings sustainable in respect of building materials? Thank you everybody. And I'm, uh, I'm proud again to participate in these uh, seminars regarding Egypt, Egyptian construction and building material. And thanks for my uh, my colleagues and the last three uh, uh, panel speakers. Uh, I will begin my uh, my words from the last words which uh, engineer Salma Hamis talked about concrete and the grass. Uh, I think in the last 20 years we are suffering in Egypt in uh, from the uh, the huge using of uh, concrete and the grass which lead to many problems according in environmental uh, CO2 uh, finger or air pollution. Let me speak also to have high highlighting with some words about all the cities and the new cities and how the people in Egypt, the Egyptian see what's the difference between all cities and new cities about the pollution, the air pollution, how to move from the old city to enjoy uh, the, uh, a new air atmosphere in the new cities around Cairo, not only in Cairo. Uh, first, also, I have to mention to Mrs. Isabel 
about their uh, efforts and the investment in the building materials because they are one of the, the most and the biggest companies all over the world in the gypsum uh, plasters and isolation uh, panels or uh, tools. That will lead that we are uh, we are talking about two pillars, pillars on to produce building materials according to a new system respecting the air pollution and uh, to contribute in the next uh, conference for COP27 COP in Egypt. Second, how to use these building materials to have a green buildings in Egypt, especially with the new settings. Uh, as may, may I have to, or I, I have to explain that we have the biggest sector here is cement in our chamber. We have cement, we have glass, we have bricks, we have marble, we have uh, quarrying, we have uh, ceramic, uh, uh, sanitary wear, uh, sanitary wear, uh, ceramic, uh, maybe I can remember something, uh, isolations, quarrying. So one of the big, uh, for sustainability, the biggest challenge that we have to be uh, modify all our plants or all our building materials to equal uh, green buildings. Uh, for cement, I think we have 23 companies now. They are doing all their efforts to, to modify their filters, the process to be suitable for green buildings or to, uh, to uh, modify all their production lines to be on the CO2 fingers to be minimum as much as you can. Also have the class, we are talking about the energy uh, savings. Uh, the glass in the, uh, we have three companies here in glass sectors. Also they are modifying their lines and how to be suitable for that. These are the main two sectors which is, will be participating in the next COP27. Uh, the third, recycling for the marble and the quarrying and bricks. You know, we have uh, to renovation some, some buildings. The output of this renovation, it will be more or less than 9 million uh, tons per, per year. So we have to make recycling for this. Uh, I think this is a main challenge now because with 110 million populations, uh, more or less 17 million population in Cairo only will suffer from CO2 grids or CO2, uh, high, high CO2 environment in Egypt. That um, leads us in the chamber that we have to study in the next three years, how to be uh, concentrate to, uh, in our all study and uh, all our members especially in cement and the glass and the marble and the granite to be suitable for green buildings. Uh, again, I will mention for the concrete and the glass, I think we have to move uh, from the old city to the new city and to move from concrete and, and the glass to bricks uh, and the stone, uh, stone uh, economy or stone uh, architecture way to move, to, to move from the bad environment to uh, a good environment. This is what uh, I mean in, uh, in, in these days, and I think we will, mean, will be the main player in the next COP27 regarding the building materials, uh, commerce, especially in cement sector. Yes, um, this is very interesting because at the moment it seems uh, that there is no alternative to concrete. Yes, when you will uh, construct big cities, what should you uh, choose? Uh, this is the challenge, I think. Uh, but you mentioned, if I understood correctly, you say, okay, we will uh, get in the production process. How yeah. can we improve the production process that we have less CO2 emission, for example? This is one point uh, you mentioned. And uh, the second is, uh, we should also focus on recycling material. This, this needs to, to have, we have in a critical or panic uh, uh, year about using gas or coal in the, our production, especially in the cement. Mm -hmm. You know now the energy mix in Egypt, 
depend on electricity, gas, and coal. Uh, uh, now I think the gas levels of prices are about 9.27. That leads the Egyptian government to not support our industrial uh, sector with gas. So they moved, mostly of them moved to electricity or to the coal. Even the coal, it's a very high price. Uh, and uh, the shipping cost now it's a little bit high, but with with school uh, uh, we are suffering from many uh, negative points regarding our production. But uh, we insist that we, um, thanks for God up to now, forty percent of the our building materials working with electricity and gas. So uh, and we are pushing our government to. Uh, back to using feed us with uh, gas to to reach about 70 percent of our production with gas it would be very very good for uh, green production uh, second the energy savings some of the factories they have internal energy uh, like glass ceramic and cement we have with the uh, egyptian modernization uh, center belonging to our ministry we have some studies now about how to use this energy uh, inside the production area. Uh, that I think will lead also for less, uh, less uh, bad, uh, bad weather inside our production plant. Yes. Third, marble, marble and stone recycling. Uh, we are suffering from a, a huge uh, waste from the marble and stone, but we have now three or four new planets that we can use this marble and the stone to produce the bricks. Uh, I think these are three pillars which we will talk about in the next uh, days. Yes, that is very interesting. I think without uh, scientific research, it will not go. We talked uh, already about uh, knowledge uh, exchange and I think uh, to reduce uh, the cement production or the uh, use of uh, uh, cement is a global challenge. And uh, this uh, why I have this question for you. Are there any Egyptian research projects on the subject of sustainable construction and sustainable building materials or international, international research projects in which Egyptian university or your institution, uh, institution participate? Well, I think now, up to now, no. But we are in uh, in in next uh, August. We'll uh, we'll have some agreements with uh, with uh, the Minister of uh, Environmental uh, Environment about uh, these studies. And I think they are cooperating with uh, three or four uh, uh, universities in Egypt about this. So it will be in next uh, August. Uh, okay, I see. So uh, there's already something ongoing uh, yes. to turn things for the better. I think this is tremendously important, yes, because you have this uh, population growth, yes, and where to leave all these people, yes, this will be challenging, but not only for your country. It's a, it's a, global, it's a global challenge. Yes. And uh, even in Germany, we, say, oh, we are highly industrialized and, and so on. Yes, we have we have a lack of, of uh, residential areas. Yes, so we will see. So thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Abdel uh, Hamid. And now I will turn uh, to Mr. Ahmed. Um, Mr. Ahmed, uh, I just switch um, the, the gallery to the gallery so that I can see you. Mr. Ahmed, it's always beneficial to hear a person who is not directly involved in a subject, but is a good observer. An economist, for example, who assesses things from a different perspective. So I would like to ask you some questions as representative of the free economy, but also as a resident of Egypt. But First of all, that we have an idea. Can you tell us what region you live in approximately and already for how long? Well, thank you very much for having us and uh, good afternoon today from Riyadh to all of you. It's indeed a pleasure to have you uh, all with me and these amazing co-panelists. Um, my name is Yusuf Ahmed, just for those who joined later. 
And as a son of a German mother and Egyptian father, I'm really happy to hear this uh, panel today, Bridging Germany in Egypt. Um, maybe just one question before I start. Uh, the connection has been cutting off and, and, and we came back. That's why I, my video turned off and on. So I just wanted to make sure you can all hear me well. Okay, lovely. So your question is where we live, uh, where we interact. Um, a bit of a personal background answering this question. I've been living in Frankfurt nine years. In those nine years, I've built up uh, a company by the name FRC Frankfurt International, um, assisting German companies and business partners with their market entry and business development in Egypt, and also strategic investment projects um, and in the Gulf region. And um, after nine years, we decided to Cairo. That was three years back. And we moved right into uh, the middle of the town, into Zamalek. And uh, surprisingly, having a European wife and kids, we liked it very much there, despite of all the traffic. You just need to find a workaround that, as maybe Mr. Hepp and Crackler said, if you want to go from A to B, usually, yes, you can calculate two hours. Sometimes you can shift it a little bit to reduce the driving times. And ideally, you don't drive yourself. Um, but then um, during COVID times, we we moved then from um, Cairo to Elguna. And the reason was the Swiss German speaking school there, because that was uh, kind of uh, not very easy in the commute and with all the restrictions in, in Cairo at those times. Um, that's a little bit of the background uh, to start with, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Yes. Um, we already learned um, uh, and we now uh, know the situation in matters of a shortage uh, of a residential building in Egypt seems to be serious and lots of buildings are under construction now. What are your impressions um, of the building activities in the cities, in more rural areas and in relation of the new urban developments? What can you see at the moment? Well, first of all, from a personal view and also asking friends, um, I, don't, I don't really have the feeling that we have a shortage on residential. I rather have the feeling that we have a slight oversupply in the high and luxury. Um, so there is, uh, if you are ready to pay Frankfurt like uh, prices in Egypt, you're, you'll find a lot of opportunities um, in the new um, development, which can be east of Cairo and west of Cairo and other places, of course. But if you go into the more affordable ones, um, it gets a bit more scarce. So it's probably very important how to, how you segment the market. But overall, I think we don't have a, a shortage. Um, coming to my impression, when I move around Egypt, and I do that a lot, we have one German client who is building a landmark in the new capital. And I go there on a regular basis. And each time I go there, it reminds me a bit of going to Dubai, Doha, and Manama in the early days. There is a new tower. There is extra height on this and that development. Obviously, the most visible ones for me being not from the industry is whenever a tower is 20, 30 meter higher. Um, so there is some positive vibes and it seems that uh, things go considerably smooth and fast. Ah, this is interesting. So uh, um, you can have a, such a upper class building and apartment that's um, this is easily to get. Yes, you already mentioned. And uh, the situation is um, comparable to Dubai or Abu Dhabi 20 years ago. Then we have an impression, then we have an, a feeling about what is just going on in Egypt. I understood correctly. Kind of. And also, if you have a chance to go and visit the German university, GIU, the German International University, it's right in the middle of the of the Cairo new business district at the new capital. Um, from there, you have a very good uh, view on, on what's going on. And there are already over 2,000 students, which was surprising information. Uh, we, we recently had an AHK board meeting there, and um, it's always fascinating. So I'd invite all of you who haven't had a chance yet to go there and take a look. Yes. Very interesting. This is uh, something new for me uh, as well. Yes, we talk about uh, apartments and residential uh, projects. Um, have you an idea what other projects uh, under construction at the moment? Uh, maybe uh, we are talking about schools, hospitals, or even mega project for transportation or things like this. My personal feeling, and of course I prepared uh, having uh, some industry experts uh, discussing with me. Um, my personal feeling and their feeling is that we still are in a 
massive governmental and public sector projects boom, but there's also a lot of new developments. One, of course, we've heard today, which is a very interesting one, Badia, um, uh, as Mr. Jürgen Hepp explained, but also a place like O West, um, in the, the west of the city by Oraskom, which, for instance, has seven new schools, one English and one German school included. Um, then, of course, also going into the direction of where Mr. Dr. Krikler has his expertise, there is a lot of also historic uh, buildings and also um, touristic old sites being renovated, um, like renovative, renovation of heritage sites in particular. And as we speak today, of course, uh, the announcement of Siemens adding to uh, the infrastructure once again with the 8.1 billion deal that they closed yeah, just last week, it was, um, is a big uh, construction um, yeah, initiative. Uh, okay, I see. This is most interesting. Uh, you gave us really uh, interesting information. And uh, I have another question. Uh, for example, uh, building interiors need to be designed, equipped and furnished, for example, with sanitary objects, floor covering, doors, heating and air condition system, kitchen and furniture. Are these products manufactured domestically or come from abroad? And I think maybe this would or could be interesting for our audience. Would German companies have a chance to be commissioned, for example? This is a very... Yeah, yes. I think German uh, companies do have a chance to be commissioned and I don't think that all of the interior design and all the uh, supplies you need are available in Egypt, but there is a good mix of locally produced uh, manufactured items and important ones that you can usually get. Of course, also here we have um, the pressure of inflation that we have uh, been talking about worldwide. Um, the same you have in Egypt, in particular with the devaluation of the Egyptian pound that happened a few months ago. But in general, yes. And I think there is an opportunity also for German companies to still enter uh, the market. Okay, this is interesting. And when you are talking about uh, chances, uh, for example, German companies, uh, another question. Uh, this uh, huge um, um, settlement projects, are they constructed by in consorts, consortia or is it more uh, domestic? Uh, the, the contractor is, is he more... Uh, domestic. This would have uh, contractors from abroad have also a chance. Mm, so certainly do. Some of the big ones are um, certainly Egyptians, but there are also quite a number of um, international uh, companies. Like uh, the biggest probably are from the international side are Emirati, Chinese, and Russian. Um, but we also have a lot of uh, local Egyptian companies like Oraskom. Hassan Alam or Arab contractors that are not only active in Egypt, but also internationally um, active in, in other countries. Uh, okay, um, so so far for now, Mr. Ahmed, um, thank you so much because I think uh, your information were very important, very interesting for the important because they have been very down to earth, yes. <laughs> uh, when we have just talking about uh, the contractors, so I may turn uh, to Mr. Hepp. Uh, this uh, Badia project, the contractor, is he uh, from Egypt or uh, who is the contractor in this case? Oh, um, these are multiple contractors. So uh, part of the strategy was to, to actually make a, design it in a way that it's low tech, in a way that you don't need to have A contractors or you're just depending on A or B contractors. So the strategy was um, overall, to make a, a construction method which is um, can be done by by different contractors, and um, I think they 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 contracted multiple contractors because it's quite a large site already. Um, the other thing, though, is uh, we have JBI Julius Berger as a as a overall site manager and construction management company. They come out also here from Germany and have a huge expertise in Africa. And we've involved them very early on in terms of construction methodology. Uh, there we did analyze already uh, more sustainable ways of um, this idea of having a low, low tech construction method while improving sustainability and um, especially climatic performance. But we, we just found out through like through different ad, uh, additives into, into the block work um, 
to, to improve the U value of the walls in, in general. The problem was just the, the overall framework, economic framework. These stones were still too expensive to be competitive with the rest. So, of course, it would require a bit more regulation from the government to improve overall uh, building performance and material performance, I believe. Um, because there are methodologies to get it better or to improve the overall performance, but uh, with the current uh, price politics, it looks like still um, a problem. And, and these we, we don't have uh, in Badia, because it's quite a large number of units, it's not all just luxurious and the price point is, is critical. So construction prices are critical, especially currently in the inflated uh, in, uh, construction costs. Yes, but I think this is a worldwide problem. Yes, this is just the same what we experience in Germany at the moment. Uh, it, was, uh, it was maybe three years ahead of the rest. It looks <laughs> like it was already a problem three years ago. Yes, indeed it was. Uh, this is, a, I can uh, uh, tell this uh, from my experience in Abu Dhabi. It was just always it was always a problem and uh, how to build best and uh, what is the best building material to choose. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Hebb, we are just talking to I uh, just talked to you. Uh, so, I found a question at the chat uh, which I would like uh, to put. Uh, could you please tell us uh, more about building materials used or how to adapt the Egyptian climate in your design? This is a question from the audience. Well, um, adapting to the climate is, of course, starts from a planning already. So um, given that I didn't have so much time, I took quite a few slides out. I, I could have lectured about 45 minutes on that. And I do have quite some nice slides where we have um, the thermal analysis. We did uh, solar analysis as well as wind modeling to, to see and validate uh, the overall planning. And of course, thermal comfort within cities starts with, uh, with air movement and of course shade. And both um, can be created to, through different means, uh, but you always need to look at the different conditions locally where you apply more shading through vegetation or through shading structures, for instance. But of course, part of the backbone is to allow enough air movement um, to, um, to, to get you the sense of a breeze to, to um, reduce the thermal uh, heat stress you have. And, and with that, of course, then you can use much more the outdoor environment. Now, coming to the buildings, of course, you've seen uh, the images of um, these balconies, and they were just, they were not only an aesthetic element. They were, of course, a passive uh, method to reduce energy or solar gain to start with. So what Ms. now said, starting with a passive design principle of reducing energy before you start replacing it with renewable energies. Um, and that has also led into the design of these balconies and how far they protruded outwards to shape the windows in the back, as well as then adding screens where we didn't have enough um, um, shading, especially when you look east or west, then of course um, balconies don't work that well. Um, and I just mentioned we wanted to improve the overall wall, wall performance, but we believe there it requires just some federal, uh, some uh, central regulation to make the build industry move into that way. Um, and it's it's as it was here in Germany as well. Um, I don't think the construction industry. Uh, just uh, moved into that direction just because they wanted, they were pushed there by certain push and pull factors. And, and that's also required locally. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think most interesting is that you have a look onto traditional uh, construction methods as you talked about um, this uh, air movement. This is a traditional idea and these are traditional consideration in the Middle East, I know this. And on the other hand, uh, you are talking about very innovative methods, yes, uh, to deal with the temperature and the humidity in this country. This is very interesting. So um, there is a voice from um, uh, the audience and 
it is also to you and I will just read it. Yes. Thank you for your impressive presentation, Mr. Hepp. In my opinion, considering the Egyptian hot humid climate while planning new cities and modern buildings is important. New buildings out of concrete and glass facades are not sustainable in a country like Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's very important if we can work on new building materials considering the immense climate change. Could you please tell us more about the building materials used or how you adapted the Egyptian climate in your design? I think what you told us just uh, in the just uh, currently just in the moment, I think this is uh, exactly the answer to this question. Or do you have, or would you like at something else? Uh, no, and um, of course, one big thing is as well um, to reduce the, the the amount of class. It's like we have in Germany. You um, need to look in how much actually of class you uh, use to reduce the solar gain, and then also look at the performance of of the class itself. But again, there. Uh, see, I, I made that experience when I worked in Abu Dhabi on, on Master City. Uh, we looked at uh, facade performances back then, um, curtain wall facades, where the German industry was already quite used to a certain air tightness, while in Abu Dhabi that was still fairly new or not possible basically to achieve. Um, again, that's something which should be driven by standards, uh, by regulation to, to move the construction industry there. It's, it's very hard just from one single project, as much and as ambitious as it is, to move a whole industry in a certain direction if there's not a, um, some more norms and regulations which try to push the whole industry there. Um, yes. But it, what we can do, of course, is always looking at the past and looking at the old methodologies on how to conserve energy rather than use active systems and so on. So, and that's our responsibility as planners. So I don't need a regulation to do that common sense planning ideas and uh, knowledge. Yes, okay. Though well, your considerations are from the very beginning, how can we reduce uh, energy use. Yes, this is this is a bottom line yes. of your considerations. Exactly. One, first, first passive and then active and then you go into the whole replacement. Um, and it's stuff we do here in Germany, but also, of course, locally there um, in Egypt or Middle East in general. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for this uh, answer. And I would like to turn to Mrs. Knauf. Mm -hmm. From her, we learned that uh, they uh, had have some uh, production plants in Egypt, and you all mentioned already mentioned it. Uh, this is also why you reduce CO2 emissions uh, because you have not these big distances, right? Uh, could you please uh, switch on your microphone, Ms. Um, Mrs. Knauf? Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry, we can't uh, hear her voice. Uh, so I would like just call, uh, give a call to the technique. Is there a problem with Mrs. Knauf's microphone? You can solve. Mrs. Knauf, could you switch on your microphone? Knauf, maybe you can uh, change the source of the, because I feel like the source of the microphone has changed. Like on the bottom left, there is the microphone icon. If you could click on there and select the microphone that you're using. Uh, or we could we try connecting the headphone <laughs> if, yes, if it try. works. Because I would like to have uh, answered my questions. Uh, from her side because uh, maybe she can give us an important contribution um, to or uh, we cannot hear you Mrs. Yes. Now, unfortunately yes maybe uh, another option could be if you could uh, quit uh, the meeting and join the meeting uh, again uh, maybe that might solve the issue while Mrs. Pfeiffer continues mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I will repeat it once again. The question was uh, your consideration to uh, to have uh, product production plants in Egypt was perhaps one uh, to save energy and maybe uh, to to save our time. So uh, we should go on. And so it is uh, Mr. Krigela. I would like to learn more about your subject. As we know, Egypt has a long history and is familiar to us in Europe in particular with treasures and monuments from the pharaonic area. The fact that, for example, the old city of Cairo was declared a World Heritage Site in 1979 is less well known. Also, you show, showed us some pictures from these old buildings. There is an enormous need, as I think, for innovation of countless historic buildings, which, for example, date back in the 19th century, which has been neglected for decades. Meanwhile, many buildings are empty because no one can live in them anymore. The preservation of historic architecture can only be secured in the long term if it is possible to ensure a new quality of life for the residents here. And now my question to you. In most cases, we are talking about urban areas and not just about individual buildings. In your opinion, what would be the first steps on the way to make the old buildings, for example, in Cairo, usable again? <clears throat> First of all, an inventory is necessary and a detailed survey, of course. Now you have to study the, the building carefully in order to understand the qualities, but also the, the problems of the old buildings. You have to, to prepare drawings usually, uh, technical investigations are necessary, structural investigations, soil in investigations. All these uh, um, studies are necessary to, to come to, um, to, to find a result. And based on, on the results, it can be then decided uh, for which purpose it is sustainable, uh, is it, it is uh, suitable, and which effort is necessary to upgrade this building and to which, which uh, per, uh, further use it could be uh, it's it's uh, it's it's useful. For example, former industrial buildings are often uh, beer, often uh, high loads, and therefore they would be well suited for a library. For example, in the opposite, a dwelling a, a, a flat is usually not uh, you ca you can't change it to an in, in, in industrial building or an official building because. The load is not the of the ceilings are not uh, so study at first then of course you have to be a bit cre creative uh, to find out what is necessary in the in the area what is what needs to the do, uh, is 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 there uh, but in cairo it's of course uh, dwelling is is uh, so there's a big demand on flats uh, uh, and um, not only uh, very costly flats, and, but also um, flats which are available for for the normal for normal people. And so you have to take, and you can kind you can find uh, solutions with these uh, buildings usually. And yeah. a big point is also uh, refurbishment. Here is usually usually easy. It's easy. Uh, they are made of bricks and uh, wood, sometimes steel, uh, with small interventions, you are able to repair this building and uh, bring it into a new use. This is also, uh, this is in, uh, usually not so costly and uh, affordable for uh, more, uh, a big scale of, of uh, people. Okay, this is a very, positive information you gave to us uh, when you're telling us, ah, it's not that much. Uh, what is to do maybe uh, to make uh, these old buildings usable or uh, usable again, where people 
could live in. But as uh, you told us, uh, it is the first thing is the investigation of the buildings, yes, to check whether the loads maybe are exactly for the use uh, you want to have. And uh, you told us you can make, you can not make a fixed change because the library is not, not possible to install for, for example, in an apartment house uh, due to the heavy loads. This is what you told us. So you, you have been talking about the load bear, uh, bearing structure, about the architect, uh, architecture, and uh, we have uh, to take in consideration also uh, the electricity and the technic modern houses need. Yeah. Um, and there's another and big point. If the old building also shapes a neighborhood in terms of building culture or emo uh, emotional values, uh, the building does not contain only gray um, energy, but also golden energy. We say if, if there is also a, a cultural aspect and an emotional aspect uh, um, there, uh, we, we are speaking of uh, golden energy, and it's very important also for the neighborhood to keep these buildings. Yeah. Uh, this is a very as interesting aspect. You are talking uh, about the emotional value, and uh, this in context with the World Heritage Site, for example, which is a Kaiwa uh, inner city since 1979. I think the next point would be a uh, feasibility study. Uh, studies, yes. Uh, should uh, residential buildings stay residential building or could we change? Yes, could be the change made in use. And I see Mr. Hepp, uh, you put on, uh, you put up your hand. Uh, then yes. I'm curious, what have you no, um, contributed in this matter? That's very interesting. And we, we worked on the framework plan for Alexandria as well, actually, since 2008 or so. Um, finished it two, three years ago. But one thing we found is actually, especially with the old buildings and apartment buildings, um, the ownership structure is difficult. And that's why many of these buildings look th that dilapidated, that they were given out or the chance for, for people to buy these units um, quite a while ago. Um, but the ownership structure is not like here in Germany, where there is a, a certain pot of money set back and the, there's a group of owners of a, an apartment and they take care at alternative one. So, and that seems to be one of the major roadblocks to really um, activate or, or uh, renovate actually some of these old buildings, which are really gorgeous and beautiful. Okay. So I think the first step, the first step would be the clarification of the ownership because it is not not clear. Yes, who is the owner of a certain building? And so it's, it's, who, it's clear and who is the owner. No, it's clear who is the owner, but it's not like when we have here in Germany. It's all regulated or how the owners work together and setting aside some money for repairs and so on over time. And, and therefore, this kind of community of owners doesn't exist in, in such a way. Um, and therefore, that, that's the, the leverage you need to take to get some of these buildings activated again. Okay, and this makes uh, things difficult, I can see. Um, as I... We've had a raised hand by Mr. Abdel Hamid for some time. Ah, okay, thank you so much for your assistance. Mr. Al uh, Abdel Hamid, please. Yes. Uh... Thanks again. Uh, uh, I want to talk about two two points. Uh, like um, as an example, like Padia, I think we have to concentrate on the building materials. In, in Egypt, the culture of isolation. They are, we are talking about water isolation. Maybe Mrs. Isabel uh, listened to me, but the heat, heat and cold isolation, uh, the the Egyptian culture up to now ignores this kind of isolation. We need this very much because we have a high consumption for um, for the heating uh, and the cooling regarding that. I think 80% of the buildings miss this heat and cold isolation. Second, okay. we are we are producing the the bricks from cement and the clay. I think we, we have to concentrate in the future to use clay bricks. Or recycling bricks from the wastages of uh, marble and stone. So, 
10,000 uh, years of civilization from the stones. Using the stones in the facade, in the cladding, in the streets, we have to concentrate also for this using. We have to make uh, like uh, uh, some seminars between the building materials and the, the designers about this. Uh, the, uh, the last, last thing, it's a mechanical fixation about this stone, not with this cement. These four points, we are missing a lot in Egypt. Uh, this is about uh, this point. The last point, which mentioned the rent, rent law in Egypt, which it's created 60 years ago, the, the ownership is very clear. But the owner getting, I think, three euros per month or four euros per month. So it's not willing enough to make renovation uh, for his apartment, which is located in the heart of Cairo. And uh, uh, you, can, you can calculate with 2 million euro or 1 million and a half euro, but it's getting only three or four uh, euro per month. I think our parliament's working a lot about this point, but up to now, they didn't reach uh, the, the, to a good decision, which we have to, to give this ownership, the, the owner of these buildings, the motivation or they are willing enough to pay for renovation because it's a, it's Egyptian wealth in the heart of Egypt. Uh, thanks for this, which uh, my uh, main point. Okay, so I see. So first, it's more or less a matter of the ownership. Second, it's a, a matter of money, yes? How, how much we have to invest in a certain building projects, I think, and what's about the technique in matter of, of the heat and the humidity. Yes, this is not solved, for example, uh, in, in the old buildings. Yes, this would be a big a challenge. Yes, how can people live a modern life in such buildings where a uh, new technique is in need? So on the other side, on the one side, to keep uh, um, and uh, preserve the old buildings. On the other side, we need to have the new technique inside of the building. I, I see this is a big challenge. Um, I have another question to Mr. Ahmed, please. So, um, when you go, you um, when you go through Cairo, can you tell us uh, what are your impressions of the of the town? That I get a feeling of of uh, of Cairo, and and, and uh, the audience, which is who is not from Cairo, has an idea. Well, first of all, you either love Cairo or you, in some, um, and this was mentioned earlier, quite uh, one of the most. Uh, uh, populated cities and also the traffic can be quite at times chaotic um, but there's also very nice areas like on uh, in the old city close to Tahrir Square where they are step by step you have the feeling that a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of very antique buildings are refurbished and are put uh, um, into you know new shape again and it, it has vibes that maybe got lost in the past years and uh, that are being revived so I'm, I'm personally always happy to go back to Cairo, um, but um, it, it really depends very much where you are. I mean, when we were in Zamalek and we drive over, I was uh, going for bike rides in the, in the city, believe it or not. And you go to just uh, five minutes over to Mbaba, you're in a totally different neighborhood where most of the, uh, uh, the buildings eventually have not had the right uh, building permits when they have been built up. Uh, so it totally differs from, from area to area. And I'm not speaking about the new satellite cities outside with fresh airs and so on. Uh, okay, thank you so much. It's a huge area. Cairo, we learned from Mr. Hibordi uh, when he starts his presentation. Now I could see a hand up from Mrs. Knauf. I hope your microphone is now switched on and it will work. Oh, we are so sorry. We can't hear you. Ah, what a pity, what a pity. Because yeah, I want... It was a telephone uh, call and put it on loud, any of us. Yes. Yes, there is also a dial-in uh, option uh, from like you must have received in the email, where the email with the joining link. Below the email, there is a number which you can also call to join. Um, 
Okay, just give me a second. I will uh, find the number and it will just now. Thank you. Oh, so I'm very sorry, Mrs. Knauf, uh, that we can't hear you. Uh, maybe you and me as member of the EMA have another chance, yes? Yes, okay. Then I hope you will enjoy uh, to be part of the audience in this time without a further voice. Oh, what a pity. So um, I just would like to go on uh, with Mr. Gregela. We have been about the preservation and innovation of building projects for example, in the old city of, of, uh, of Cairo. Um, uh, we have talked about this innovation, uh, but sometimes buildings are extremely damaged. Uh, where does renovation make sense and where demolition? There, because we talked about recycling of uh, materials and why not could be stones or for example, the concrete of demolished building be a part of this recycling circle. So when does it make sense that we can redevelop a building and when would you decide, no, uh, this building should be demolished? Oh. Okay, of course you have to look uh, at the results of, of the studies first. Uh, first point is you have to prepare the studies and uh, not to decide without any study. And I'm sure that this will happen very, very often that uh, people look at the building, it's not nice anymore. And so they decided, okay, let's demolish it. And you have to look carefully on it to decide. It uh, cannot be saved, of course, then it must be replaced. In this case, the use of building materials should be considered. And there are possibilities, of course. You can mix concrete, for example. Here, uh, we have the, uh, the, uh, uh, so the, the uh, recycling concrete. And um, as far as I know, 25% of old concrete could be mixed to, to the old, uh, to the new uh, concrete. So this would be, of course, one solution. And uh, concrete is also, a valuable uh, material for road buildings. So you can use it for, pre, pre, uh, pro, for, for building uh, roads. Uh, as far as I know, the, in, in Egypt, the um, recycling industry or recycling companies are, uh, are present. They, they take care if wooden elements inside houses or steel uh, they they uh, dismantle this materials uh, very carefully and they recycle it. I think there's uh, still a recycling uh, industry uh, acting. But um, of course, uh, first you have to, uh, often, very often no attempt is made to prolong the life of the building and uh, the decision is quickly made. And so you have to, to start uh, with, with, the, with the aim and with the goal to, to, uh, to preserve the building and first to think about what is possible, what could be done. And uh, then of course you have to calculate uh, the costs. And in many cases, I'm sure it, is, it, it would be uh, useful to, to keep the building. Okay, so this is a, to, uh, to uh, make a check whether it's um, economic, yes? Yes, yeah. what are the costs for renovation? What be the cost for a new building? And then uh, this is, uh, a, 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 this, the, this makes a decision where you can say, okay, we will refurbish or we will build a new building. And okay, in, to take this account. Uh, okay, this is very interesting. But you also talked about the emotional value of a building and maybe the de uh, decision will be, okay, we will have this building for the future and we will rescue it, I think, yes. It depends on several aspects, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, before we close this event, time flies. I have to tell you nothing but time flies. I have one last question to Mr. Hepp. You, ah, Mr. Uh, Ahmed, please. Then before I, we are curious what you have to tell further for us. 
I'm just quoting what Mrs. Isabel Knauf is writing. I'm not sure if we went through that, or ah, if you've okay. seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ah, she says, okay. why not avoid concrete? Here. If you yes, want to uh, maybe read this to the audience, thank you. Uh, okay, I just have a look. So uh, why not avoid concrete? Okay, I will read it aloud. Why, uh, Isabel Knauf, she wrote to us, why not avoid concrete as much as possible? Built in steel, fully recyclable, and drywalls, fully recyclable, and receive a building that is more, much more energy effic efficient. Yes. Uh, thank you for this uh, contribution, Mrs. Knauf. The yes, how to make buildings more sustainable. Uh, this is one from your side. And I think we all here in this round, we are open to new ideas and how to improve uh, the um, construction in matters of sustainability. This is our goal. This should be our main goal. I think this is a conclusion and I think we all here in this round will agree. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed, uh, that you uh, had, uh, were attentive enough to tell me that we had a uh, contribution from Frau Knauf again. But um, as I already told, Mr. Head, uh, you introduced this big, this huge pro uh, project uh, to us. Now, I think uh, we are curious, uh, when and how did you, your planning firm, ISP, initially made contact with Egypt and how long you are here uh, and how, how such a huge commission? Hmm. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, quick answer to, to Ms. Knauf as well. It, it looks like the world is divided be, uh, between steel and concrete countries, and I believe uh, Egypt is still very firmly in the concrete uh, sector. Uh, but of course, it has always something to do with uh, fire protection and so on, and the complications around that, why certain nations are not going fully into steel works, as Germany us by the way as well. No, but how did we come in? We are already in Egypt since 2006. Uh, we worked on the 6th of October and Sheikh Said uh, city master plan or framework plan. And then, as I mentioned before, we dove into the two uh, in 2008 into the Alexandria framework plan, which, um, uh, which was a project which went through the whole, let's say, troublesome years in Egypt and it was actually quite a challenging time to get that project uh, through that time and through that of course we started building up context uh, we have a strong local partner uh, who we always collaborate with on these projects so I believe it doesn't work without a good local partner to work with um, and it's it needs to be always projects in mutual interest of uh, everybody and then um, these projects can be done even though of course, as German um, expertise, it's not the cheapest, I believe. Um, therefore, um, we need to bring value to the table and then share it with our local partners and uh, they do a lot of the work as well. Um, otherwise, these projects cannot be economically uh, shown. Yeah, so that's from my end. Um, of course, it's very exciting always to uh, work in Egypt, and we are looking forward to the next project. Okay, I see. Important is, so uh, as conclusion, is the expertise you bring me, for example, it was the expertise in Germany, and it was uh, a reliable uh, Egyptian partner. This was, yeah. this have been the two points. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting, and I think this can be uh, uh, good information for the audience uh, who would like to start a business in, in Egypt. These are the preconditions, expertise, and a good partner, and uh, being connected in the country or start uh, good connections. I think so. As I already mentioned, yes, we have to come to an end after two very interesting, impressive um, 120 minutes. Uh, yes, it was an interesting exchange about Egypt about national and global challenges in terms of population growth, climate change, sustainability, saving resources, dealing with old buildings and future oriented architecture and even much more. 
We have heard and learned a lot and had quality first-hand information. And for the audience, it, if you had further questions or suggestions, please send us an email to the next or to the EMA and you'll find the full addresses on the respective websites. I would like to thank our audience for the interest and say a big thanks to you, our panelists, for your time and for your commitment. And it was a pleasure to meet you as dedicated professionals. Stay successful in your positions to move things for the better. Thanks once again to the next attendees, to Claudia Zenders. If you would like, uh, put up your hand once again, Claudia. Yes, Thank it was you. a pleasure. It Thanks was a to pleasure. Emma. Yes, mm -hmm. it was a pleasure to work to you. Thanks very um, much for giving us this opportunity. Yes, and uh, thank you so much also to your colleagues and you who accepted our request from the EMA side. Yes, thank you so much. So all the best to you. And definitely, I'm curious when our paths will cross again. Still have a nice day. Keep this event in good memory and stay safe. Goodbye to you all. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.